our introduction to carbohydrates has given us some detail with regards to their structure, but not much. For example, carbohydrates usually have the elements carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen only, and that they are either aldehydes or ketones only. But regardless of what you choose, they would always have a lot of hydroxy groups or OH groups. Now, it's hard to discuss structures without seeing actual structural formulas, so let's do that. The first thing we will talk about is the linear structural formulas for carbohydrates and you will see them often like this. Now, the preferred choice that we use for discussing the linear structure of carbohydrates is the Fisher projection formula, which this one is the classic example. Now, the difference of the Fisher projection formula to the, let's say, usual condensed or or skeletal or Kekulé formulas is that the carbons are not written in a zigzag or horizontal fashion but vertically as you can see here. Okay. Now here at least we can now try to recall the functional groups as we observe them. Like for example, if I have a C double bond OH then we should remember that this is an aldehyde functionality and that all the OH groups here are our hydroxyl groups which fulfills the definition of carbohydrates as we have seen in the introduction. Now, drawing this in this manner actually takes up a lot of time. I think you would clearly agree with me, simply because there are a lot of lines and letters. So this is also a Fisher projection formula, and I think not a lot of books would agree, would agree with me on how this is drawn, but this works best for me in conserving time. What I only did was to convert the aldehyde group into its condensed version, CHO, or CHO, and then the carbons in the middle are just represented as intersections between vertical and horizontal lines, and I hid all the hydrogens. Um, you can assume that on every blank spot, or let's say empty spot, that's where you should assume the hydrogen to be, okay? And I would prefer using this because it's cleaner in some way. Now, there are a lot of things that we need to talk about here. First, look at this. If you pick one of the carbons in the middle from this to this to this to this, there's something common with all of them. I think it would be very easily observable if we look at this one. In this carbon, you can see that we have four different substituents attached to it and that all of those are different. One of them is an OH group, one is an H, one is a carbon with an OH group, and one is a carbon that's part of an aldehyde. And remember, every carbon that has four different substituents, we call chiral. And if you remember, we usually mark our chiral carbons with, a ma with an asterisk. Okay, And that is to say that Carbohydrates are actually highly chiral. In fact, I could say that this one, this one, and this one is chiral. Even if you try to assess them one by one, you would agree. Now, you do see that I didn't mark... Let's use a different color. You would see that I didn't mark the aldehyde group and this carbon at the other end as chiral. Why? Remember, the two keywords for chirality are for and different. If I have a carbon with a double bond, you should remember that the maximum substituents of that carbon would be reduced to 3 only. Also, remember that the hybridization for chiral carbons is sp3, but if I have a double bond, that becomes sp2. Long story short, it's impossible for a carbon with a double bond to have chirality. Actually, there are some rare cases that they do, but those rarities will not be covered here. Also, the carbon here at the bottom is not chiral. Why? Because I have here two substituents which are identical, which disqualifies the word different in four different substituents. So actually, that makes it easy. Because as long as I have a carbon that's part of a carbonyl group, and I have a CH2OH like this one, then I could assume that's not chiral. Like this one, like this one, or like this one, or like this one, and everything else that's not part of that, I could, you know, 
automatically assumed to be chiral. Easy, right? Now, let me tell you the names of these. The name of this one is actually D-glucose, and the name of this one is D-fructose. And normally, what we do whenever we have a monosaccharide is to try to describe its structure. Remember, when we have a monosaccharide, we can further describe it by its functional group and by the number of carbons. So let's do that. For D-glucose, first, it's an aldehyde. So we can say it's an aldose. Now, it has how many carbons? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So it's also a hexose. So actually, what you do instead of using these two words separately is you combine them. So instead of calling it separately as an aldose and a hexose, you can just call it an aldohexose. Or for defructose, it's obviously a ketose. The carbonyl group is inside, so it's keto. And the number of carbons is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 also. So we can describe defructose as a keto hexose. I think one last thing that we need to deal with here is this one. What's with the letter D? I think a lot would ask. And in biochemistry, we actually have what we call D and L isomers of a certain substance. And for carbohydrates, we have such thing. So if you ask me, how do I know if it's D-glucose and not L? That's actually easy. Here, the basis is what we call the penultimate OH. Penultimate is just a dictionary term that means second to the last. For example, I know that I usually count starting from the top, and therefore my last carbon would normally be the carbon at the bottom. So this is the last carbon. So therefore, the one above it should be the second to the last. So I can, you know, call this the penultimate carbon. And the OH there is the penultimate OH. If that OH points to the right or is written to the right, we give the letter D. If to the left, letter L. And since my OH here is at the right, that's where we got the letter D here. Or here, for example, again, this is the last carbon. This is the second to the last. This is the second to the last OH. Since it's also written at the right, then we also use the letter D here. That's easy, right? So I think before we proceed to the cyclic structure of carbohydrates, we could do a bunch of practice on these examples. So let's start with these silos. First, let's describe it. First, the functional group is an aldehyde, so aldo. And then the number of carbons is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So we can say that these silos is an aldopentose. These silulose, uh, it's not an aldehyde. The carbonyl group is inside, so it's a keto. Then the number of carbons, actually you're, you're going to have some kind of clue for some cases. Some, not all, only some cases. They're almost the same name, so most likely they have the same number of carbons. As you see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So it's also a pentose. But this time it's a keto pentose. L erythrose, aldehyde, so aldo. Then the number of carbons, 1, 2, 3, 4. So it's an aldo tetrose. D fructose actually luckily has already been answered a while ago. So it's a ketohexose. I mean, even if you check it here, it would be a ketohexose. Ribose here, let's see. It's an aldehyde, cho, so aldo. Then the carbons are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so it's an aldopentose. And then finally, for mannose, so you see another aldehyde group here, so aldo. But the carbons are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, so hex, aldohexose. It's very easy, okay, as you can see. Now, one last thing. Note that I didn't put the letter D or L yet on these two examples because I think it would be nice for us to do that on our own. So again, how do we do that? How do we assign the letter D or L? We look at the second to the last or the penultimate OH. So for this ribose molecule, this is the last carbon, this second to the last, and my OH here is pointed to the left, written at the left, so this must be L ribose. 
And here for Manos, this is the sec uh, the last, this is second to the last. My OH is written at the right, so this must be D Manos.